All right, folks, John Henning here with the Franchise Radio Show, and today we're joined by Mike Siniscalci, the CEO and founder of 810 Billiards and Bowling. Mike, thank you so much for jumping in, buddy. I appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me, John. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. Now, before we get into the business stuff, tell us just a little bit about you. Who are you? Where are you from? Where do you live? That kind of thing. Just give us just a 30 second. Here is Mike. Sure. From uh, New York originally. That's where I grew up and I uh, uh, went to school at Lehigh University in Pennsylvania. Uh, spent my first decade of my career in finance. Um, most of that is an equity options market maker uh, based out of Chicago and then New York. Um, and then in 2015, moved down to South Carolina and started uh, the business there and uh, opened our first location in May of 2015. Uh, spent seven years living in South Carolina and just a couple of years ago, uh, moved my family out to Phoenix, Arizona, which is where we call home now. All right, good deal. Just a side note, I happen to live about 30 minutes from Lehigh University, so I'm just, uh, just down Route 100 there towards uh, King of Prussia area, right? Yep. Yeah, so I'm, I'm pretty familiar with the area. It's where I lived. I uh, grew up in central Pennsylvania and moved down here 25 years ago with my wife. She's from this area. And, you know, with what I do, I can literally do it from anywhere in the country, right? So, yeah, a lot more of that these days. Yes. Uh, hey, I was remote before being remote was cool. Okay. There you, know? you go. <laughs> All right, good deal. Well, let's jump into the business stuff here a little bit. Why don't you tell us a little bit about 810 Billiards and Bowling, kind of the, the founding founding of the company, bring us up to speed on where you guys are at and what the journeys look like uh, to get you there. Sure. So we're, you know, upscale entertainment as uh, we've been coined. So, uh, you know, casual dining, lots of different uh, entertainment uh, options inside our, our buildings. And um, you know, started the first location in North Myrtle Beach, uh, South Carolina in 15 with, uh, you know, as a proof of concept there and then uh, scaled a couple more corporate units in the South Carolina area before um, getting into the franchise space, which actually started, started pursuing that in around 2018, 2019. Um, and then kind of as soon as we got everything up and running for that, uh, COVID put a bit of a damper on indoor entertainment, as you can imagine. Uh, so we kind of paused that, uh, figured out how we were going to manage uh, that adventure. Uh, came through it uh, quite well, really proud of the, our team and the way they handled that over those couple of years uh, and actually got some opportunities out of it. We uh, took over a, a lucky strike, both two of them, one in Phoenix, one in Houston, and that were shuttered during the pandemic and um, and Lucky Strike was not coming back to them. So uh, we took those over, converted them over to A10s and, uh, and got those open the end of 21. Um, and uh, and they're both doing well now. And then as the uh, the COVID freeze thawed, um, the interest in, in our space and franchising, um, you know, took off. I think I was a bit of a silver lining for us in, in COVID was, uh, it was obviously difficult for theaters and indoor entertainment, but sure. uh, not having those social gathering venues, I think uh, really made people appreciate how, how thirsty they were for it and how much, uh, how much that really adds to a social experience. And um, so coming out of that, had had really good interest in, uh, you know, what we do and, and uh, a lot of good partners have come on board in the, the last 18 months or so. Um, you know, so where we stand today, those, the five corporate stores, uh, in Greenville, South Carolina. Um, and, uh, at this point we are 16 franchisees under agreement, uh, and we have, uh, seven of them under LOI or lease and the, uh, the other, um, nine are still, you know, working through site selection or newer signings. So, uh, so you know, a lot of uh, Florida development is a big part of the pipeline, but uh, certainly expanding across the country. You know, we think that's one of the upsides of our concept is it's uh, it's a universal uh, appeal. You know, no matter where you go in the country, there's going to be a pretty consistent demand for family and young adult entertainment with high quality food and beverage program. So, uh, you know, we're, we're uh, coming into California in a couple of markets, uh, all the way over to, to Florida and, uh, and a number of markets in between. So uh, that's uh, where we stand today. That's good. You used a phrase there that uh, I've never heard before, the eatertainment, right? 
Yep, you know, the uh, we're, we're, more, we're more than entertainment. You know, we're proud of our kitchen and bar programs and, uh, and you know, we, we want our guests to enjoy a meal while they're with us, not just come in for bowling after dinner somewhere else. So, uh, you know, that uh, is kind of the niche that uh, we, we fall into is, uh, you know, a food forward entertainment space. I like it. I like it a lot. So look, the big question everybody's just been waiting on the edge of their seat to hear is why 810? Yes. So, you know, from the first location, um, had, you know, always intended to scale the concept once we got uh, through that, that first location and figured out all the things we had to learn. Um, and to that end, I, you know, wanted something that was going to be a little more scalable from a brand standpoint is, you know, the more traditional uh, bowling centers, it's always, you know, or even where I started, you know, it was North Myrtle Beach Bowling Center. Sure. Little River Lanes, Myrtle Beach Bowl, um, and wanted to, uh, you know, develop a brand that was going to be a bit more agnostic to market and be able to, to port to other areas. Um, and, you know, I liked a number for that reason, um, you know, not really tied to any geography. Um, and the actual 810 choice, uh, some people think it's a split, but it was actually a, uh, if you look graphically at our logo, I think it's a bit of a nod to it. Uh, the eight is eight ball billiards and the 10 is 10 pin bowling. All right. So we, my wife initially had guessed it was a split and I said, no, that would be the seven ten split, right? Yeah. That's, yeah. that's the one that, that everybody knows about. But I said, no, it must be something else. And then when I looked at the name billiards and bowling, I'm, I am a big uh, billiards and pool player. So that's, that was my guess was the eight, eight ball and the, and the 10 pins. So good that's deal. It. All right. I like it. I like it a lot. Well, let's talk a little bit more about the franchise side. So take us through like the, what is the business? We know that there's, you know, bowling, we know that there's billiards, we know that there's food, but give us an idea of scale, size, number of employees, like walk us through the model itself a little bit on the business model. Sure. So, you know, there's definitely a variety in terms of the size of our footprint, um, but our kind of core focus when we go out for site selection in a new market is 30,000 feet. Um, and on that footprint, you're going to have about 20 bowling lanes, eight championship billiard tables, a hundred seat dining and bar area, uh, typically incorporating our milkshake bar as well. A uh, mean mugs milkshake bars, a uh, concept, uh, store and store concept that we've launched uh, in the last year. And, uh, and most of our franchisees are, are opting in to, uh, include one of those as well. Creates a nice synergy with the other things going on in the building. Um, you know, additions for corporate events, birthday kid parties, and add on a uh, souvenir milkshake for everybody. And so, so that's a newer piece uh, and continue to diversify the entertainment uh, options beyond billiards and bowling. Uh, in, in that 30,000 foot, you'll have about 5,000 feet of arcade. Uh, also, we'll have uh, three or four high-end uh, dart lanes that okay. we do on an hourly basis. Um, and uh, you know, and then we've added a couple of golf simulators to that standard program, sports simulators. So, you know, more um, group uh, destination and, you know, entertainment pieces for, uh, for the event side of the business. And, uh, and in the same vein, added a uh, um, axe throwing product with uh, four lanes of axe All throwing. Right. So, uh, so, you know, we cram a lot of, uh, a lot of program into 30,000 feet. A lot of fun. Sounds like a lot of fun in 30,000 square feet. That's it. And, you know, and the event uh, side of the business has been a, more and more a, a larger piece of the puzzle for us as we've uh, built a sales team over the last couple of years from from the ground up. And mm -hmm. uh, and that's a big value proposition for our franchisees as well. Um, you know, having started with one center, I realized you're kind of stuck in the middle between you need a sales presence, but you, you don't really have the bandwidth to justify a full time sales person. Sure. Uh, and even if you have one person, they've still got days off and you've got downtime in, in terms of uh, taking uh, leads and converting them into to event business. So uh, we built a national sales team that supports all of our franchisee locations in addition to the corporates, um, takes all, you know, any uh, party inquiries in real time and can uh, you, you know, uh, facilitate that sale uh, as soon as the customer is reaching out without any uh, need for tags. So, and, um, you know, as we built that uh, event revenue pipeline, realizing, you know, we get a good frequency of 
corporate clients want to come in every quarter um, with for team building and these other things that have become a lot bigger outside the office as the traditional office presence has shrunk. Uh, sure. Companies are looking for good venues to you know create that team atmosphere that um, that used to kind of happen around the water cooler and uh, now everybody needs to get off of Zoom and and go get in person somewhere. So. Um, by adding some of these other things like golf simulators, axe throwing, um, then groups can come out with a higher frequency. And, you know, you, you, you came bowling last month. Why don't you come uh, spend an afternoon in the simulator and have some food and beverage and uh, do that for, for this month's team building outing. So, um, so it sounds like of- a, uh, Mike, it sounds like a subscription model in the works there, right? For the corporate. So I'm <laughs> just saying, you know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's uh, no one in our space is really doing it quite like that yet, but uh, but it has been something that uh, you know works in a, a lot of similar, you know, you know, uh, tangential industries. You know, tramp parks and other entertainment styles are are big on it. So it's uh, you know it's in the roadmap, but uh, what that looks like is still very much a question mark. So. Hey, let's talk a little bit about your uh, your franchise owners. What, what Who is an ideal owner? Like there's a lot of different types of entrepreneurs out there, a lot of different experience levels, investment levels, folks looking for different things. Who who really makes an ideal owner for uh, A10 Billiards and Bowling? Yeah, ultimately we're looking for, you know, a uh, financial savviness in terms of understanding financial statements, uh, profit center management. Um, and, you know, that's the, the main function for most of our franchisees are not typically hands-on. Um, you know, after we get through opening, um, most of them are more in, in executive model um, franchising, where uh, you know we're, we require a GM that you know brings the food and beverage experience. A lot of franchisees ask us, you know, do I need to know uh, how to execute food and beverage? Do I need to have hospitality background and uh, you know, absolutely not. I mean, that's what, you know, our training and, and hiring uh, assistance is for. Um, but uh, from the franchisees themselves, it's typically, um, you know, looking for a passive source of income. Uh, and the most important thing from our side is, is yeah, that, you know, ability to manage at a high level, um, a relatively complex operation, right? We've got a lot of different things going on under our roof and uh, all those things need to uh, work together harmoniously and, uh, you know, so t- managing that leadership team inside the building mm-hmm. uh, and managing, you know, that uh, financial statements, P&L, balance sheet, and being comfortable, uh, you know, understanding what those statements tell you about the business and uh, where there's opportunities and, um, you know, what, what we can do to, uh, to ensure success. So, what does the employee landscape look like for you guys how many um you mentioned like uh corporate handles you know some of the the national sales center stuff but from a day-to-day operations how many employees and what types am i hiring if i'm an owner yeah absolutely and so on the sales side uh that does you know take the sales outside of the individual stores so that way our operations team in each location gets to just focus on executing for the guest uh, doesn't have to worry about the sales process and uh, just concentrates on, you know, inside the four walls and making sure that we're, we're delivering a great experience because ultimately that's that's obviously what's going to bring people sure. back and, uh, and make a successful location. So in terms of the roles there, typically it'll be uh, five managers, a, a GM that, uh, again, we is not the franchisee. We uh, require you to bring somebody in, usually looking for 20 plus years, uh, high volume food and beverage experience on that side. The the entertainment piece we can teach and train. There's uh, we got that pretty well locked down. And although we do the same thing on the food side, there's no replacement for 10 plus years of experience on a high volume uh, in a high volume sure. kitchen bar. And uh, it's you know we we can train the recipes, but uh, being you know slammed on a Friday night and uh, keeping those ticket times down that's uh, that comes from experience so uh, so that's typically the GM profile will be uh, doesn't need to be come from entertainment but they do need to come from high volume food and beverage um, and then that GM will go out and hire uh, their team of four managers so it'll be a kitchen manager three front of house managers mm-hmm. uh, each of the three front of house one will take bar one takes our host team one takes our server team. And then obviously your kitchen manager is responsible for everybody back in the house. Um, 
So that's kind of your, your core uh, five person management leadership team. Uh, and then they're each going to hire their specific departments, handle scheduling, training, inventory um, in, um, in those respective departments. So you're going to have you know, typically six to eight in the kitchen, line cooks and dishwashers, uh, 10 to 12 under the server team, uh, front of house, uh, you know, handling guest facing, uh, five to six bartenders, um, and typically six to eight hosts, which tend to be, uh, you know, typically more junior employees, often high sure. school or recent high school graduates, um, you know, at the host desk to kind of greet our guests coming in and, and help get their experience started. Uh, at which point the uh, servers will take over from them. But, uh, but so overall, you're typically 30, 35 to people uh, in terms of total headcount. Uh, large majority of the uh, the front of house there, bartenders, host servers, those are going to be part-time roles. Yeah, it makes sense. Makes sense. You got to cover the all the different shifts and everything for for the business. What does a day in the life of the business owner look like? If you're if you have that GM and you've got the different verticals of your other managers and they have their teams, what what is it? Um, I already probably know the answer to this one, but what is it that the owner is really focused on as far as working on the business? Yeah, well, that's exactly it, right? We want the owner focused on working on the business, not working in the business. And right. Um, so if they feel like they got to be inside the building for uh, the product to be what it needs to be, then uh, we've, we've got an issue. Either we've got the wrong people in the wrong seat or we failed to train properly or something else is, is a mess. So, um, you know, we want our franchisees in the building as much as they want to be there, but to be confident that when they step away, they're in good hands and that that management team, um, you know, is properly aligned and properly trained. And so that allows them to focus on the business, which, uh, you know, being out there as a brand ambassador in the local market, I mean, that's the kind of the heart of the franchise model, right? Is, sure. we, you know, we've, we've got the business model, we've got um, the tools, the SOPs, the upstream support, the, uh, you know, equipment and install experience. The franchisees have uh, their local market knowledge. They know, uh, you know, the right sites in their backyard where people are going for entertainment to, to, uh, to develop the site. And then once we have doors open, they're out there, um, you know, working with the Chamber of Commerce, working with city leadership, uh, you know, potentially uh, generating event leads and things and community outreach. Uh, and then, you know, obviously staying uh, highly in touch with their GM and their management team to make sure that, um, you know, anything that does pop up that um, needs to be addressed by them uh, can be quickly. Um, they're also driving their local marketing. So, uh, you know, our marketing director provides content, guidance, you know, grand opening budget and spends. Um, but uh, in terms of actually deploying your local advertising spend, that, that uh, is typically handled by the franchisee, um, uh, contracting billboards, radio, what, what have you. Uh, and so, yeah. Yeah, I mean, once uh, in those first couple months, it's definitely hands-on. We expect our franchisees to be in the store and setting those baselines uh, of a new business right. and uh, understanding what food costs, bar costs, expectations should be establishing that. And then uh, once we get through that kind of three to four month opening um, window, then yeah, it should become more of a, uh, a, a community liaison brand ambassador role where um, they are out and about uh, you know, getting people interested in ATEP. What uh, what type of investment level are we looking at? I always tell everybody to reference the franchise disclosure documents to get the exact numbers, but just kind of give us a general idea of, of a range of investment here and how much capital does someone need to bring to the table? Yeah, so, you, you know, great question. Obviously, we're in a uh, capital intense concept, you know, as a significant build out to everything we do. And, um, you know, the upside of entertainment is, once the doors are open, you got a high margin cash flow on your entertainment drivers. The downside is you got to buy all that entertainment on the front end. So right. um, the uh, the overall investment uh, typically is about $100 a foot in terms of construction and build out cost, uh, including your leasehold improvements and your you know trade fixtures and and uh, and equipment. Um, and we're usually seeking out uh, tenant improvement allowance from the landlord to offset between 30 and 50% of that. 
so typically, you know, twenty-five to fifty dollars in uh, tenant improvement allowance mm -hmm. uh, will cover a good chunk of that. And then our franchisees are typically using a SBA seven A loan program to cover another thirty-five to forty percent, and then uh, are putting in, you know, ten to fifteen percent uh, sure. cash equity injection. So, um, you know, in a thirty thousand foot scenario, you know, I would we would tell our franchisees, you want to have five to 600 in liquid capital available for the project. Your actual hard injection is typically going to be more like 400, mm -hmm. uh, 450, and then uh, the remainder be your uh, working capital and, you know, starting inventory. Good deal. Good deal. Now let's talk a little bit about the training side. You know, I'm assuming you, you mentioned a couple of things. We can train the entertainment. We're looking for this kind of person for the GM, that kind of thing. But walk us through what does the training look like for an owner? And then is this a train the trainer type model with the staffing side with the employees? Uh, yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, we don't require our, our owners to go through the training. Um, they're, they're always invited, but uh, it is not, not a requirement. Um, but the GM and, and their management team goes through an extensive uh, four-week training program where they either, depending on where the location is, they may come out to South Carolina where mm -hmm. we can train across multiple locations there. Uh, or if they're a West Coast team, they'll, they'll be going to a Phoenix location uh, to, uh, to do the training. But um, you know, basically you're going through a pretty intense module over four weeks where doesn't matter if you're the right. bar manager, you're the server manager, you're the kitchen manager, you're cross-trained and everything inside the building. Uh, ultimately, even though those departments are going to be your focus and what you're accountable for, um, everybody, you know, ultimately is there to ensure a great guest experience. And, you know, sometimes the kitchen managers got to go make a drink or uh, the server managers got to hop on an expo and these things happen in, uh, in the hospitality industry. And, uh, everybody needs to to be comfortable doing that and kind of get their feet wet in in every uh, aspect of the business. So that's typically the the uh, onsite program executed by corporate, where we're training that five person management team over an extended period. Sure. Uh, then we're going back to local market, where our opening team is working with our franchisees management team now to hire their frontline teams, uh, and then we'll do you know onsite. Uh, training for your servers, bartenders, line cooks. Um, so, so yeah, we're we're training that management team to to then train their team, but we are also sending our opening team as uh, support and reinforcement uh, during that on-site training phase, so that uh, you know they're not expected to have retained 100% of everything in their uh, their four-week uh, crash course. So. Um, we, we continue that support through um, through grand opening and then typically within a week or two after grand opening and getting to actually uh, drive the car themselves for, for uh, a week or two, the, uh, the local management team at that point is, is usually ready to take the reins 100% and, um, and drive from there. It's probably, it sounds a little like uh, drinking from that proverbial fire hose, but then you're there with the training wheels to help them along, right? You know, it's exactly. We've very comprehensive, yeah. Put them through the high volume in that four week uh, program and they'll definitely uh, be tested through that. Uh, and, but then once we come back to uh, to do it for real for their store, you know, we're, we're, we're there to uh, exactly like I said, have the training wheels, have the support. And, you know, when you forget something in the heat of the moment, but, uh, we're, we're there to retrain and, and address any gaps. That's actually my very next question, Mike, is about the support. You know, I'm assuming at this kind of scale and volume that you guys are providing a lot of support to the to the franchise owners and the team members and stuff. What does that support look like? You have somebody that's like their designated person in operations, or how do you guys provide that type of support? Yeah, absolutely. And and as the you know a concept of this size, it does have a couple of different elements to it. Um, in terms of the day-to-day -day operations, that really falls to our director of ops, who is their go-to point person for, you know, any any mid-chef questions, anything that that uh, comes up in terms of scheduling, uh, you know, cost of goods, labor cost management. Uh, that's really all going to fall uh, in our director of ops. And typically, what we'll do now is they'll they'll have a uh, bi-weekly. Um, management call uh, typically an hour with the franchise team's management 
uh, to identify any issues, answer any questions, take feedback on, you know, maybe new menu items they think would sell in that particular market that maybe isn't incorporated in the uh, the corporate uh, menu program. So, um, you know, it's definitely a two-way street, but that kind of touch point is uh, is every other week to um, to keep a nice cadence on the communication. Um, and then, you know, on, obviously on the sales side, they uh, our sales team has a weekly uh, call with the franchisee management team to give them their uh, lay of the land in terms of events coming down the pike. Uh, here's what you have lined up for the next 10 days. Uh, you know, any specialty menu items that might have been offered for an event or, we, you know, that way the kitchen manager knows if they need to get special product in or uh, have anything else. GM is on those as well so they can staff appropriately for, for the events. Um, and then on the marketing side, like I said, it's really driven on a day-to-day -day basis by the franchisee, um, but supported by our director of marketing, content creation, uh, you know, social media, uh, content, radio advertising campaigns, et cetera. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so it's ultimately the, uh, the director of ops is kind of our, our main touch point for uh, the day to day. And then at the, the owner level, I typically will have a monthly in the beginning and then move to a quarterly uh, review with them uh, directly to, to kind of go over at a higher, higher level. Let's, you know, how, how was, p l for the month and uh and let's kind of go through that and you know and then also take feedback from our franchisees on what they see as as an owner right is different than what their team might be seeing and telling our ops team uh in terms of opportunities for new products new you know new uh improvements that we can be thinking about so having that um, added brain trust from franchisees in those uh, owner seats is um, is really valuable. So we're yeah. excited to be continuing to have more of that. Um, I've always uh, excited to hear franchisors talk about that aspect of it, because obviously we, we don't know everything about everything, right? So you get that feedback from the franchisees about what they're experiencing and make those you know, adjustments. Uh, that's, that's really, really positive. What the reason I bring that up is because you probably know this, not every franchisor does that. Right. So I'm just saying sometimes it's a tell them how to do it. Other times it's work with them to figure out how to do it better. Right. You know, so I'm really, uh, really excited to hear you say that. Yeah, we definitely fall in the latter category there. You know, we're a young brand. We're uh, we've got our model pretty uh, tone, honed in at this point. But uh, as we go into new markets and as we you know continue to evolve and offer you know, new, new entertainment um, drivers and different pieces inside the program. Uh, there's always going to be uh, room for good new ideas. You know, I want to talk just a little bit here as we get towards the end here, Mike. Uh, give us an idea what, I mean, there's a lot of things out there that we can do now, right, as consumers. So I'm, I'm a consumer. I can look in, in Google and say, okay, here are the 20 things I can go do. What's the difference in, in your type of business versus other competing businesses out there in the same market? Um, yeah, ultimately for us, you know, we're not, we're not the only bowling alley in town, any town we go into, but uh you know, it's kind of a two tranched uh, industry picture where you've got your traditional bowling centers uh, that are never going to catch up on the food and beverage program. They're, they kind of take their league business and do their thing. And we're happy to let them have that. We don't do leagues. We're, uh, you know, we're an entertainment concept for a casual entertainment customer. Uh, and really that brings it all back to hospitality and that that entertainment customer has choices right because they're they're not a league bowler who's going to go there every tuesday for 38 weeks and you know and have that commitment um they're they're going to have a lot of choices for where to spend their food and beverage dollar their entertainment dollar uh and it all comes back to a service experience that uh, is you know unparalleled and we've done knowing that from the beginning that's really how we've built uh, our systems and our program was all around um, that full service customer experience once they walk into the building. So, uh, you know, for one example, you look at our more direct competitors um, that do offer a lot of different entertainment things inside the venue, not just the traditional bowling centers, um, but we're able to streamline that experience for the guests. So uh, you come in, you check in, um, and then 
you never have to go back and wait another line. You uh, are at, from that point forward, your server becomes your point of contact with the business and your experience, uh, them and their tab uh, and your, your check throughout the, the experience follows you as you go do different things. Um, you know, whether you want to go to the arcade, you want to go throw darts, you know, then you want to hop on a bowling lane, your server's sticking with you, uh, and you're having a seamless experience as opposed to, okay, well, now I got to go cash out for the bowling, and I got to go open a tab at the bar, and uh, now I got to go back up to the host desk to get the darts for, uh, you know, the dart lane, and so this way, um, you know, everything um, is seamless, and you, you know, hopefully, Kind of look up after a couple hours and realize, wow, where did the, the time go? We we're having a blast. Having fun, right? Yeah. yeah. And uh, so it's basically trying to uh, remove the hurdles to uh, to having as much fun as possible. Well, you you said something there that I think is a huge differentiator, and I want to make sure our listeners hear what you said there. You the phrase you used was, "We're okay with them having that league business because that's not who we are." right? And knowing who you are in any business is important, of course, and who are your customers and your customers aren't necessarily those league bowlers. They're the folks that want, and you've used this word, and this is the one I want to emphasize, like with an exclamation point is the experience. Cause I think that's probably the, the biggest differentiator, the, the uh, freezer pizza at my local Bob's bowling alley is, is not what we're looking for here at a 10. Right. So, and you know what I mean? The soft pretzels that really aren't soft. Right. Yeah, so oh, yeah. the yeah. nacho cheese that's been yeah. sitting there for a week. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. So that experience has got to be the huge differentiator here, right? I mean, I love what you guys have done with adding in the different. You you mentioned a couple of things with the dart lanes, the the axe throwing. You've got, and it seems like even from when you started, you're still looking at other opportunities to bring you know different revenue streams in as well. With the milkshakes, you mentioned the the milkshake bar. So that's pretty exciting stuff for somebody that's looking to grow with a company that's looking to grow. Yeah, that that's exactly it. You know, we're we're a young brand. We got a lot of territories still available, and and uh, we're continuing to evolve. You know, the core program has proved itself and works. You know, the what I would call the core program is our billiards, bowling, food, and beverage. Um, but as we continue to evolve and learn, we're you know adding different pieces that uh, that work together. And so whether it's you know mini golf, axe throwing, uh, golf simulators, right? It's like what what is a synergy both for what the guests are looking for and for our labor cost management. And if you're, sure. uh, you already got your host on there to hand out bowling shoes, get folks to their lanes, no reason why they can't uh, hand out a, a putter or um, take them over to get them set up on, on axes or, or dart lane. Um, so uh, just trying to find things that um, make sense, both from the customer and revenue generation standpoint, also from, uh, keeping an eye towards uh, cost management and being able to um, to take more of that um, entertainment revenue uh, to the bottom line. Well, Mike, I want to give you the last word here as we wrap up. Uh, let folks uh, know, you know, what what why eight ten, right? And then how should they reach out to you if they if they want to reach out to you guys? Is it best to do it phone, email, web? How do you how do you want to connect with people? And I'll make sure to include all the contact information on the page where we host the podcast as well for you guys. Yeah, absolutely. So the YS is uh, is an interesting question because I think we're a bit unique in the franchising space in that uh, we're the only uh, entertainment center concept that I'm aware of that is franchising. Um, so there's, I, I think the, the bigger question is, it, as for our potential franchisees usually is, do I want to get into the entertainment business? Right. Uh, you know, if they do, we're, we're kind of the... Uh, the best option out there. Um, there. We do have plenty of competition, but it's all it's typically privately held or, um, you know, large public entities, not something where an individual investor has access to participate in, in the system. Um, and then in terms of, you know, okay, I'm looking at lots of different franchise options. Why do I want to go with an entertainment center? Um, you know, it's the there's pros and cons to everything, right? The, uh, like we talked about, there is a significant initial investment, um, but the the other side of that is your um, that that investment you make, that uh, large footprint, that uh, entertainment presence, is a pretty strong barrier to entry for competition coming into the market around you, sure. right? I'm, I'm, I might pop up a subway shop next to a Jimmy John's, but 
I'm not going to do a 30,000 foot build out down the street from somebody uh, doing the same thing I'm looking to do. So uh, once, once you kind of plant your flag in the ground, you've got pretty strong uh, barriers to entry. And obviously once you get up and running, it's a very strong margin business. So, um, you know, that's really um, what uh, is, is the main driver, I think, for the interest uh, that we get from uh, potential franchisees. What's the uh, what's the best way for folks to reach out to you, Mike? How do you want them to, to reach out and raise their hand? Yeah, the best way is probably going to be on our website, a10bowling.com. And there's a franchising drop down where you can submit a quick uh, inquiry form and then we'll get back to you with, uh, you know, our playbook and some interviews like this and some more uh, material for folks to dive into and and help evaluate if it's a good option for them and then um, how to take next steps if they're interested. All right, good deal. I'll make sure I'll include that information here right below the uh, the interview for you as well, all right? All right, sounds good. I appreciate it. Yeah, my pleasure. Well, there you go, folks. John Henning here with the Franchise Radio Show. We just got done talking with Mike Siniscalchi, the CEO and founder of 810 Billiards and Bowling. Mike, thank you so much, buddy. My pleasure. Thanks again for having me, John. It was great to be here.